Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for joining in today. Uh, and before we begin, I just wanted to give you a small overview of the agenda for the today's talk. We will start uh, by introducing Trey, and uh, then after that, Trey will be giving a presentation for about 20 minutes. That will be followed by a Q&A session, which will be for 30 minutes. And finally, we'll have some closing notes for about five minutes. Uh, all of you know Trehan, of course, from the course, uh, but let me give you, let you know something a little bit more about him. Uh, Trey researches the human experience of cycling and an iterative collaborative way of working in planning organizations. He is a co-organizer of Unraveling the Cycling City MOOC and Planning the Cycling City Summer School. He's also the founder of Design a Bicycle User Experience where he maintains an open toolkit of human-centered design methods for cycling. Trey combines his design education from the New School of New York with an MSc in planning from the University of Amsterdam to provide a unique perspective and expertise in the field of cycling and urban design. Uh, the subject of uh, Trey's talk today is about exploring an iterative way of working in a municipality as demand for cycling rises, cities are scaling up their bicycling planning and infrastructure efforts. Many planning organizations are stepping into the new waters. There is a need to experiment, learn, and be responsive. An iterative way of working is well suited to do this. This research explores what this way of working could look like in the bicycle planning context through the stories of practitioners in the municipality of Amsterdam's bicycle program. We conduct 12 semi-structured interviews and two narrative interviews with process mapping exercises and latter, and latter of which explore one project in detail, intervention at the Alexander Plain intersection. We present how the way of working in the bicycle program and the Alexander Plain project demonstrates agile characteristics, practices, and barriers, and discusses the implications for planning and for cycling. So uh, I will hand it over to you, Trey, now. Uh, please start with your presentation now. Thanks. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you today. I hope uh, this is also more of a discussion than a presentation. So mine will be a bit shorter than 20 minutes. And uh, I have some questions I want you all to think about before, and I will show you those briefly. Uh, and I'm going to put in the chat box uh, two links. Um, one is to a presentation from earlier this year on the same paper, and one is the paper itself. So I'll put that in right now. Um, this is to reference, so I'm not going to go over everything in this presentation, but essentially I'm going to report back on some uh, on research on a special intersection in Amsterdam. Uh, myself, I'm from uh, the US. I'm from uh, originally San Diego, California and lived in New York for about four years and then I've been in the Netherlands for about two years. Um, so this intersection is quite, uh, it's, it's new, it was new for me when I came here and it should be interesting for all of you. So I'm going to share the screen now. All right, I will start off with uh, these questions. If everyone's, has anyone, everyone used Mensimeter before, potentially? Uh, basically, it just helps us to see, uh, kind of crowdsource some responses from people. So I want to ask you guys, how and where do you learn about bicycle infrastructure? I'll give this a minute or two. Uh, if you go to mensi.com and put in this code, participation is optional. I'm just curious to see what you guys were thinking about, and then I can frame how this presentation will give you a different perspective, or perhaps uh, an existing perspective. So here's the code, 783425. Uh, we also have one more question after this, um, this one. Um, so uh, it will give you the option to put in multiple answers for these, and we will see what people say. All right. We'll put the code also in. Let's see. 
All right, looks like we're getting some responses in now. Um, Sune, can you put the code in? Oh, wait, actually, maybe I can get this. Um, yeah, I got this, never mind. Okay, the code is in the chat. And for now, while we're having people's responses come in, I'm going to um, show you the intersection that we're looking at today. So uh, this is the intersection, Alexander Plain. You look around, you can see what it is, tram tracks, cars, cyclists, people walking. This is what it looks like approximately today. Right now, it's, uh, there are no traffic lights and all these different modes interact. The primary user is people cycling. Um, the large majority of people going through this intersection go through so on the bike. And, uh, but there are a good amount of trams. There's a low amount of cars and a low amount of people walking. Um, in Google, Google, oh gosh. Um, in Google Earth, all right. Soon is the audio quality okay still or? Uh, yeah, we can hear the, uh drilling, but it's all right. Uh, all right. Still yeah. And, and uh, comprehend what you're saying. Yes. So hopefully if you guys, if it gets bad, please let me know. I will have to move, but uh, my, in the building I'm in, there's, there's been drilling on and off today. And with, uh, with Cordona Virtus, it's, uh, yeah, limited options here. Um, so this is Alexander Klein. And if we go back a few years, you can see in 2016, you can see there are traffic lights. So over the course of several months, the municipality of Amsterdam did a uh, pilot project where it had to collaborate with many different stakeholders uh, across different groups within the city and without, outside of the city to test how they could improve traffic flow and interaction at this intersection. So these traffic lights are now gone. Um, and now people, there are, remain yielding markings where you can see on the, on the street, you can see these triangles, shark's teeth, they call them. These de designate who has priority, but otherwise you have to use eye contact and social interaction to navigate this intersection now. All right, so let's go over and see some of these questions. Um, all right, so the first one here, uh, let's go. Yeah, well, this one. Okay. So the first question here, where and how do you learn about bicycle infrastructure? It looks like literature is it, but there are also other things. This is interesting. All right, so it looks like, uh, yes, going through manuals, local experience, good case studies, the cycle move course, direct experience, real world examples. So this will be a case today. I think it's interesting because uh, Today, you will be seeing how a city, which is known for its cycle infrastructure, is learning itself still on how to, uh, well, improve the environment for cycling. And it's learning by experimenting itself. And that's what this paper and this presentation is about. Iterative way of working is doing something, seeing how it goes, evaluating it, and moving forward from there. Um, does everyone see this new question coming up? I'd like to ask this one quickly. Uh, yes, we do. So. Okay. Hopefully, it comes up in the uh, yes in your screens also. Right. I will mute myself in the meantime.
All right, well, this is really interesting to see. Um, perhaps, I don't know if, if anyone's interested in the comments, let me know if, if anyone wants to have like a screenshot of this later, because I'm also curious for this. I didn't expect, I wasn't, well, I didn't think that, think of this would be so cool to see all this stuff. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the reason I'm asking this question is because uh, this is also very relevant to this research that I did. And we found that this iterative way of working is important for learning throughout cycling infrastructure, but also implementing. And implement, we've seen, may actually may not be the best word to use. Maybe it's not the most accurate, but for now, this is fine. So we see uh, talking to stakeholders, lobbying, guidance documents, site examples. All right, and I suppose in some way, uh, the reason, one reason why some of you may be here uh, listening for the Amsterdam case is a case study to talk to your local context about. So it's interesting, great. Um, all right. I will move over to the presentation now. Okay, hold on. Screen sharing is issue. Great. So the uh, title of this is Collaboration, Experimentation, and Continuous Improvement. You can read more about the research and the two links I put in the description before. And this is a very quick overview. The municipality of Amsterdam uh, is the large organization that I'm going to be talking about. And within the municipality, uh, I did interviews with people in the bicycle program, which is a cross-cutting program of uh, program and project managers. And these people work with well, I should actually mainly say program staff. They work with project managers across the city to enable project managers to incorporate cycling into their plans. So they don't per se have one, it's, it's I should say it's, it's central, but it's also distributed. So for context, um, even before the pandemic, there's been a uh, growth and in interest in cycling. And something to think about now is that uh, as lots of new governments want to incorporate cycling into their mobility, there's a lot of new things they have to think about, especially given the past several decades, they've been thinking about how to optimize vehicle traffic. Now they will have to be thinking about new users on the road to cyclists. Here you can see uh, in Paris, it's quite insane. Some of the pictures we've seen in social media of Paris, uh, temporary, or I should say maybe not temporary, uh, pop-up bike facilities in Berlin, other places, and in Mexico, a uh, huge demand for uh, bike shops. Um, as uh, people, as planners have to expand cycling, cycling infrastructure for a wider population, uh, this learning is going to be important for them, also for the organization. And we will see in this presentation uh, case. Some of you may have heard of something called Agile. Um, it has some baggage, so I'm going to have to talk about what this means specifically. Uh, in a traditional way of working, you have a more formal linear uh, working sequence and you're trying to optimize something. You already have a goal and you're working in a straight line towards this goal. Uh, in this quote unquote agile perspective, you are constantly reevaluating what you are trying to accomplish and how you should do this. And this is called double loop learning. And this is key. Um, other key characteristics are collaboration, experimentation, hence the title of this presentation. Uh, this is the important thing to think, know about for this is this is more about uh, principles. Uh, there are frameworks of agile working, which some people may know, um, such as Scrum, and this, this research did not focus on those because uh, those, are, those are not necessarily agile working, those are frameworks and sometimes they can be commercial. And uh, so this is not associated with that. This is the approach to working, including these principles. All right. Uh, let's move on. Some of these characteristics, you focus on people and interactions over processes and tools. You're responsive. Information drives decisions. Uh, you embrace conflict and discussion. And you have more flexible, interchangeable roles. Uh, in terms of practices, you will have frequent collaboration between different uh, roles in the product team and also with the customer. 
And in our case, the customer is open for discussion as to what that is. And this research, we heard planners and designers say that their customers are politicians, stakeholders, other stakeholders, citizens, the people cycling. That's something interesting to think about. And uh, other things, frequent feedback and continuous testing and improvement. So this is what you will think about. Uh, this is the way of working that I'm researching in this. These are some barriers that literature have shown uh, that are, are barriers to an agile way of working. And in these interviews, we also explored with the workers where and how they encounter these, such as management style, organizational culture, uh, existing technologies, top management support, shared understanding of what this way of working is. It's a big one. All right. And we also go to the specific projects, the intersection I showed you here, where they removed the traffic lights. And they did this in a very, uh, they did this in a set of uh, actions, but they originally turned off the traffic lights. Here you can see they're off. Uh, and they uh, did interviews, they did traffic counts, they did video analysis, um, and eventually they took steps to get towards where they are today, where there are no traffic lights. This was not a given, this was an experiment, and it ended up being an act of learning that's been applied to different intersections throughout the city. And if you're familiar with Amsterdam's geography, uh, you can see here, this is in the center of the city. So it's at a very high traffic cycling area. So um, briefly, this is what we found with the municipality of Amsterdam in general. Um, this is not a focusing on the Alexander Klein intersection. We found that the manager's role and collaboration are very important for balancing interests and stakeholders and for dealing with challenging conditions. Uh, even here, they are dealing with limited time, capacity, money, and many changes going on in the city. And collaboration was not easy. Um, and it was perhaps possible because of certain people. Um, but things like small working groups, feedback, working across departments, and these agile practices uh, enabled to balance these different interests and stakeholders, such as fire departments, police departments, um, other typical sort of stakeholders here. Um, yeah, local residents, uh, people cycling, who in this case were uh, somewhat ignored, even though they were a very large user group. And focusing on the Alexander projects specifically, uh, we found that uh, these three themes are very, very connected. Uh, an iterative project strategy works very complementary with legitimizing an intervention through analysis. Meaning the city of Amsterdam had a test, they turned off the traffic lights and in conjunction with this, they were sure to monitor this uh, qualitatively and quantitatively and doing this together, uh, it builds more consensus. It, it gave them tangible data to bring to other stakeholders. Um, and the qualitative research especially gave stories and the stories, uh, are another tool. Um, the, the temporary nature of the project made it possible to maneuver stakeholders and organizations. Um, as people knew this was not necessarily permanent and it was based on if it would be beneficial, uh, people weren't able to take baby steps. What this means for planners essentially is understand your own working context um, look for opportunities to intervene and think about the people in your organization. Um, if you're looking to work in an iterative way, um, keep the focus on principles and goals. Do not, uh, the goal is not to be agile, so to say, it's to learn and better serve citizens. So be mindful of your language that you use and uh, your interactions. But this means for planning organizations. Uh, we think this way of working is has potential to develop organizational capacity to facilitate a shift towards cycling. And in, in the case of Alexander Klein, which if you want to learn more about, you can see the full paper, um, there were benefits to only partially agile working. So if we go back to those principles in the very beginning in that table, that was all not necessarily occurring here in Amsterdam, uh, but uh, the interventions still move forward and they're still learning uh, through this and they've applied this to other intersections such as multiplying in the center as well and they have a different way of looking at traffic now uh, that's more based around social interaction in the center and lower speeds 
versus higher traffic speeds and using traffic lights to create order. So this has changed their perspective. And uh, lastly, I will go to this learning cycle here. So essentially, uh, experimentation lets you do all these things. Experimentation will help with learning. You gain more knowledge in your organization and as a professional, then you're able to iterate with this knowledge, reflect, and potentially experiment again. And you can see this is somewhat of a circle here. All right, so if this is interesting, I'd recommend uh, you look at the links. I will now go into Q and A. Um, one other thing is, since I'm talking to people who are pro pro probably in the uh, cycling field, um, this is a current research I'm doing. If you are interested, or actually, if you have 15 minutes, I invite you and uh, kindly ask uh, <laughs> you uh, do this survey. So essentially, this is around people-centered design, and we're trying to build a data set on how cycling can grow uh, through people-centered design. Uh, this link is here. I will put it in the chat box. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. My contact info is here. Um, and uh, yes, as was mentioned in the beginning, so I do research at the Urban Cycling Institute. I help organize some courses. And then I also work on my own uh, sort of passion projects, small business on the side, uh, which is designing device user experience. And this is very much in line with the uh, human-centered design research that I'm, I just mentioned. And you can see more about the Agile uh, working here at this link. And I've also sent this presentation to uh, Sune and uh, Facundo so they can share if anyone is interested in this uh, afterwards. All right. Uh, thank you, Trey. Yes. Shall I keep the screen up for a minute? Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Just need to keep the screen. Uh, thanks very much, Trey, uh, for the presentation and uh, giving us a brief overview of Agile uh, way of working. Uh, some of you who might be from uh, a computer science background might be familiar with uh, Agile working. Uh, but it's a very, very nice way of working uh, and, and reaching solutions to problems in an iterative way. Uh, so uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, do type them out on the chat screen and uh, we can ask them on your behalf uh, to Trey. Yes, uh, in the meantime, I want to ask Trey uh, a couple of questions. Um, so the first question is, how have Dutch engineers and urban planners been asked to work for some of the new emerging cycling capitals, such as Paris, for example? Ah, interesting. Can you say that one more time? My audio quality was a bit bad. Yes. The question was, have Dutch engineers and urban planners been asked to work for some of the new emerging cycling capitals, such as Paris, for example? I think that's, yeah, interesting. I don't know if uh, urban planners specifically are working there. I know there's lots of dele delegate uh, groups that come to Amsterdam to learn from Dutch planners and municipalities specifically. I don't know if there's transplants in other cities, but I definitely think the knowledge and ideas are spreading. Okay, um, we have another question. Um, so the question is, uh, if you have a cooperative municipal body, this all sounds brilliant. Unfortunately, in Melbourne, in Melbourne, local councils do not cooperate in general and find collaboration with cycling advocate groups and anathema. What do you suggest? Yeah, this is a really good point. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind for this is uh, at one level you work with people. There are organizations and there are also people. Um, I think an immediate step would be talking to people that are perhaps receptive and um, let's see more. Um, yeah, so local councils should not cooperate in general. It finds, yeah. Um, this is very difficult because some of this stuff has to come from within the local council. Um, as an advocate group, you can uh, show some things like this, show the process of how this sort of learning works. Um, you can suggest talking to people. Um, I think continue what you're doing, be, I guess be mindful of your language is something I should say. 
Um, otherwise, this is very tough. Okay, so another question just came in. It says, with this consultative iterative approach, how do you reassure traffic engineers that their expertise is valued and they can change from cars to bike and walking without threatening their egos? Oh, this is another good one. Um, hmm. So in this case, I will say that uh, a traffic engineer ended up taking on this project uh, completely within the municipality, despite not initially being on it. Um, so they, uh, yes, they saw some of the results and they were very excited, but from the beginning, they were not on. Um, once they were given ownership, that was very important and they were able to take it as their own. Uh, once they're able to take it as their own, I think they can do a lot of cool things with that. Um, cars versus bikes and walking. Yeah, that's another subject. Um, I think if you attempt it from that angle, that may not be very productive. Um, I think getting the, getting shared goals and shared understanding of what you're trying to work towards, maybe what kind of street, what kind of city you're looking for is uh, perhaps a bit more uh, doable. Okay, another question is, uh, what was the view of the public regarding the transformations that took place in, in that intersection. Really interesting. So it was very mixed. And uh, I was part of the research group several years ago that gave, uh, well, conducted interviews, uh, sort of intercept interviews, we called them, where uh, right before the intervention, when we turned off the lights, we stopped people at red lights for 30 seconds and asked them a very brief set of questions and about how they perceived the intersection, how it would be different with traffic lights or not. Um, people hated the intersection before, um, and they hated it less afterwards. Um, I'm not sure that, you, yeah, the hating part, I think it's a nice intersection, um, but there is, uh, it's, it's busier. So perhaps for, for locals, it's, uh, it's a bit much. Um, in terms of others, so there were uh, a few local uh, people that uh, had their own concerns, and certain people had very loud voices. I think there was one, one or two people um, that were very concerned about uh, children crossing the street without the traffic lights, which is a very important uh, concern. Um, these were all collected uh, along with the interviews. Uh, and it was, I think, important to make sure everyone was heard. Um, but decisions, decisions were made collectively based on everything that was heard. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Indian. The question is, how do you engage the daily wage workers who are actually the regular cyclists in most of our cities into making safer cycling infrastructure? Um, any case studies or recommendations or suggestions on how to start the dialogue and develop it up into an activism group? Okay. Um, here, I think doing things simple as interviews sharing people's stories is very powerful. There are lots of different ways to share stories. Uh, actually, the sort of side project I have, Bicycle User Experience, uh, and, and the link here, um, has some tools for this. Um, any case studies or recommendations? Yeah. Um, you know your context best. You know who to talk to, where to start. Um, in this site, I do have some tools that I try to make widely applicable. Uh, the main thing is get, making people visible. Uh, like you mentioned, the daily wage workers who are the regular cyclists, this is a very good point. Um, these people often are not vocal, but they're, uh, they're a very important part of the discussion. Similarly in Amsterdam, um, I don't remember the exact percentage of people who were cycling through, but I think it was around, it was a very, very high number, something like 70% or so of modal share in this intersection was cycling. But yet these voices were not heard. The, the voices were, other stakeholders that uh, yeah, they had their own sort of loud interests. So I think uh, telling those stories, however you see fit in your context. Another really interesting question. Um, the, the question starts with, I've been recently looking into traffic calming measures and how in some cases, what is effective in making people drive drive slower seems to contradict classic traffic engineering know-how. 
Was there any surprises in the Alexander Plan project on how and how people responded to the changes? And also, were any additional measures such as traffic calming or signage required on the streets leading up to the intersection? So two things to take into account for this case is that already on a network level, traffic volumes are lower than in uh, more accommodated car, excuse me, car dominated cities, uh, especially in city centers. There is already some traffic calming on streets surrounding the intersection. Um, and speeds are also lower, speed limits are lower. So uh, this made it possible to much more, uh, much more suited to turn off the traffic lights here. Um, in a place where you have mainly cars driving through at high speeds, that's not an intersection where it, it's as practical to turn off the traffic lights. Um, so signage, this is interesting. Signage uh, was not used here. In fact, all, all the signage was removed. And uh, this is a discussion points, I think. Um, people are not, excuse me, people are not always, uh, well, there are very mixed views on this. Um, but the idea, excuse me, the idea was to have social interaction uh, govern this intersection, meaning you have to look for people's bodily cues, how they're moving, you have to look for how fast they're driving, you sort of tell what is happening uh, and you decide whether you want to break or so. And it makes people be more attentive. Uh, when you have traffic lights, people are obeying a perceived set of rules. Um, so you have a new sort of social organization at the intersection where you have to be more engaged. Did that cover most of it? Um... Yes, I think it did. Uh, okay, I have another question um, that says, cities are implementing cycle lanes for a pilot period of one year for example in Brisbane. How do you advocate and make this a permanent one when there are when there were hardly any cyclists using it during that period of time? This is difficult. Um, there's the reason why you're asking is that there's no clear good answer here. Um, there is a long-term planning element that some planners and uh, decision makers have to understand. Um, in terms of making it politically acceptable, I would say telling the stories of people that are using it, saying the impact that it has. It, 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 I imagine it does have some impact on some people. Um, keep those stories visible. Um, but yeah, there's going to be some long-term mission needed from people that are working uh, on these cycle lanes as well. I um, mean, perhaps try them somewhere else. Take any momentum to try pilots in different places um, and be aware that the pilots are not they're the pilots, so they're probably not perfect. See what you can learn from these pilots, how you can change them over time. Um, ah, another thing with the pilots, I think it's quite interesting when citizens get more involved in these. Um, ideally, there is some citizen need or wants for um, cycle lanes somewhere. And if you go with, with those where there is the need, um, there will be people talking for you. And it's much easier to amplify their voices when you have them pushing for this already. Another question. Um, my current challenge is to persuade the municipality to first think fully and in long term with the help of consulting engineers and then go for infra implementation. They just want something fast and implement 80 kilometers of infra in just one year. And I think this approach will result, result in more problems and reduce the acceptance of biking um, manner of residence. How long did it take for you to think about and then apply the changes in Alexander Plain's intersection. So for context, the scale that you're talking about is much larger than this Alexander Plain project. So um, yes, keep that in mind. <laughs> this is uh, one intersection, 80 kilometers, if I'm seeing that right, is uh, yeah, quite a bit. Uh, it's also exciting, so congratulations. Um, but uh, yes, I think that's a good point. Perhaps it results in more problems if, if it's not thought through. Uh, and it reduces the acceptance. So in this case, uh, the intervention happened over a period of months. Um, so they had an, an initial uh, research period for a few weeks where we did interviews in the street, we did traffic counts to assess the initial situation. Later in the summer, uh, we took a few months to turn off the traffic lights and do an initial evaluation. Uh, yes, initial, excuse me, additional evaluation. Um, from there, decision makers were able to think about it and only from there afterwards, uh, they decided a few months later if they wanted to, uh, over the course of a year or so, 
um, fully remove the traffic lights. Um, so the learning period uh, was several months, maybe around half of a year. And there's more documentation online if you're interested. If you Google this intersection, uh, a colleague of mine, Meredith Glazer, has also uh, talked a good amount about it as well, um, as she coordinated the study. Um, uh, yes, but then the permanent infrastructure, the actual physical removing of the traffic lights took a little while afterwards. It was not immediately, they didn't just take it down because these are not cheap things to, to do. Um, Okay, I want to think more about your question for the 80 kilometers of infrastructure. It sounds like it's also a lot of different contexts, perhaps, so the infrastructure will be different in different contexts. I do think the storytelling component is still important to this. Of course, I'm biased because this is my, my sort of specialty. Um, but uh, regardless of where you are, it should be very clear whether the infrastructure is effective or not based on how people experience the infrastructure. Another question, um, was there extra funding to survey people on the intersection and assess each stage of the project? How was this gained and supported and was it seen as cost effective transport planning? Really good question and uh, there should be more on this in the paper. Um, it should be, it's been a little while since I've written this, but uh, essentially this was meant to be a very quick cost effective intervention. In theory, just flip a switch, turn off the traffic lights. Should be simple, right? Um, but because of the time it took to talk to all these different stakeholders, ended up being more expensive uh, in terms of personnel. So it was not super easy or cost effective before the intervention um, actually happens. And before the uh, initial evaluation happens, there were months and months of uh, discourse between the bicycle program staff and different stakeholders, such as the public transport authority, fire department, et cetera. Um, so uh, this was funded, I, I suppose, as uh, normal staff time. This is just taking their own time. So that's, uh, yeah, I can't give a number on that, but that's what it is. And uh, funding itself. So um, they did hire an outside company to conduct the traffic counts and the more quantitative analysis. And they hired a team, well, they yeah, hired a team from the University of Amsterdam to do the qualitative analysis. So there was some funding for this. The uh, that evaluative work is also learning work. Um, so it wasn't seen necessarily as just for that in, uh, intersection. Yeah, so in, in that way, it's cost-effective learning, but is it, is it one cost-effective intervention? intervention? No, because of the amount of stakeholders involved. The next question is, I think, has a really interesting point of view. Uh, was there any change in road safety at the junction before and after the scheme? People often fear that something will be unsafe, but there's fears, uh, but their fears proved to be ungrounded. Yes. So short answer, uh, no, there was actually no change. Uh, there it was not more or less dangerous. Um, yeah, and short answer, I should say also, uh, Think about what you want to define as road safety um, and think about how it connects also to a network level if you have more people walking and cycling um, there's much less of a chance for fatal accidents um, so uh, that's often not thought about in larger debates too but in terms of specifically at, the, at this intersection there was i believe no reduction or very very minor change that was not significant um, in, uh, in crashes here um, but often between people cycling, the crashes are more minor and they're not, um, yeah, if they were to happen, they're not as, uh, yeah, they're not fatal, for example. Um, yes, but there's more information if you uh, search this online. Um, I don't think that specific thing is in the paper, but online there's, uh, yeah, Meredith's Guardian article, among others, has some more information on this. So another question says, in the Alexander Plain project, can it be that the whole idea worked because of the people's attitude? Many car drivers are bikers too. Yeah, look, so there's, there's conflicts happening here. Um, that's even part of this way of working. You have to accept this conflict and, uh, and work with it. I don't think everyone wanted this in the beginning. If you go now, people may actually forget that there used to be traffic lights, uh, depending on who you talk to. But, um, yeah, and actually, 
because so many people cycling had to stop and they didn't want to stop at the traffic lights. Um, so many people were happy, but there were some that were not. Um, many car drivers are bikers too, yes. And there are, in this area, there are a few car dri people driving cars in general. Um, yeah. Okay, so there, then we have another question that says, in India, many municipalities are ca cash crunched. Uh, the limited budget and the contribution of automobile sector to the Indian economy and mobility makes them spend the limited money on building more roads. Do you have any recommendations to change this? Uh, in what ways can cycling be made profitable to the municipalities in such cities? Yeah, cycling costs less to build for. Cycling can use asphalt roads just as cars can use asphalt roads, but much less maintenance is required for these roads. Um, so in this case, uh, they're a cost-effective uh, yeah, intervention. They're also much more accessible. Uh, if you want to reach more people, more people are able to ride a bike if, versus not everyone can afford to have a car. Wow, there's a lot of messages. Oh my gosh. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, if I'm... I can take a little bit of time afterwards to answer some of these if needed. I don't know. Looks like we have like 10 minutes left. I'll let you decide, Sune and Fakunda, how you want to do this. Uh, we got we got time. We can we can extend the session by what minutes more. So okay. Yeah. Let yes. Uh, in any case, if there were uh, some questions that were left hanging, uh, how can they contact you and uh, ask the questions? Yes. So if you prefer email. My email's here. Uh, if you want to just connect in general, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, also designing a bicycle user experience and Urban Cycling Institute are on these social media platforms. Great. Uh, okay, so we have another question that says, um, was communication given to business owners, residents and community entities informing the neighborhood about the change in expectations prior to the experiment, uh, prior to the, when the experiment occurred? Yes, I believe so. So I don't have the same level of insight as the actual planners that did this because I was a researcher. But from what I heard, yes, there is communication. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, uh, one of the major hurdles uh, that has to be faced is engaging shop owners and retailers along the proposed bicycle network where they propose cycle lanes and remote parking. Have you got any examples and any ideas for engagement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is a, so from the perspective of this research, I'm not extremely useful for this question. Um, however, this is, a, from what I hear, a very common problem. Um, and there are uh, solutions out there uh, that do show that, uh, well, people cycling in certain studies shop more. Um, they take up less space. You can fit more people, more people that uh, cycle as customers versus uh, someone parking. Um, some of this is, I think, uh, personal communication. Depending on who you're going to talk to, you have to know how to approach someone. Uh, everyone is receptive to different things in a different way, um, and really sort of mastering this art of storytelling and, uh, yeah, interpersonal interaction, I think, is important. So I, uh, yeah, I don't have a perfect answer for that one. Okay, um, then we have more of a clarification question. Uh, the question says, tactical urbanism has been much discussed during the pandemic as a way of trying out changes to road infrastructure on a quick, low cost basis to try things out before trying them, uh, trying to make them permanent. This sounds consistent with your approach. Is this correct? And then uh, there's another, another question that says, if there was no change to safety after the traffic lights were turned off, what was the principal benefit? Were traffic flows substantially improved? Was the change worthwhile? Great questions. Uh, the first one is yes, absolutely. Tactical urbanism is very much in line with this way of working. Um, and uh, yes, they're very complimentary. Um, was there, if there was no change to the safety? Yes. Um, the principal benefit was, uh, I think, twofold. Uh, first is traffic flows were substantially improved uh, for people cycling. They no longer had to stop at the stoplights. Uh, because it was an intersection, 
with the majority of people cycling, it was not made for them. Traffic lights are for to regulate car flow. Um, people, people cycling are able to interact on their own. Um, so what's the change worthwhile? Um, sorry, the second twofolds was uh, the social interaction that happens between people at the intersection seems to be a different way of looking at traffic in general. Uh, whereas one way of looking at traffic is you have to uh, move objects through space based on hard rules, hard engineering rules. This perspective was people can negotiate with each other together through social interaction. Um, so this insight was very important and it's helped the municipality redesign other intersections that prior were very tricky to solve. And, but because now they have this new perspective, they can do things they never thought of before. They're not limited to a very strict set of uh, rules. And this is in line with what I mentioned before was, I can actually bring this back here. Um, yeah, double loop learning. This is when you reconsider the, uh, the boundaries that are, uh, well, instead of trying to optimize something, you reconsider what you're trying to do in the first place. So this enabled the municipality to do this. Um, so yes, I mean, everything is, all these interventions are, uh, are they worthwhile? You have to choose a metric you want to base it on to, to decide whether it's worthwhile. But based on those two things, it was very worthwhile. Then we have another question that says, uh, when we talk about an agile way of working in the context of urban planning, how do you decide on the duration of it, each, each iteration? Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, so my view on this is uh, there are more stricter frameworks uh, such as Scrum or, well, there's, yeah. So my, my point is these frameworks aren't necessarily uh, they're not necessary to follow because the frameworks often distract you from your actual goal. You may, you have to decide for yourself how long you want to take for these. In this case, um, it was a few months. Maybe the uh, local conditions will ask you to change how long it is. Um, but uh, the point of this way of working is that uh, you don't need to tie yourself into stone immediately. As you learn, you will have more information as to what is the best way for you to go. If you have an idea now, you can, you can easily set something arbitrarily and change it later. Um, but uh, yeah, there's no, I'm not advocating for any certain amount of time. Okay, so um, another question uh, about two very specific um, commuting or well, uh, groups. Uh, how does this intersection serve emergency services and disabled users? Yes. So this was an important part uh, to incorporate into their decision as well. Uh, disabled users, um, it's, yeah, so I can't speak specifically to, I'm not a disabled user, and I think it's important to hear from people themselves uh, how they move through the intersection. Um, it seemed to pass the tests that were needed. Um, in general, in Amsterdam, there are issues with, uh, uh, with streets being, uh, yeah, disabled user, sort of friendly or accommodating. Um, and that's something I think that needs to be addressed. Um, but this intersection, uh, it was, so yeah. And I think this is also a discussion we have to have uh, a bit wider as well. Um, when you have no traffic lights, things are somewhat more, they're definitely less predictable. And if you are blind or if you're in a wheelchair or something else, you will move through this intersection in a different way. There is personal responsibility on all of us to interact with people that are blind or disabled or any other sort of uh, disability um, with respect and safety through intersections. If we have traffic lights, I guess my, my uh, sort of framing here is if we have traffic lights, you have very hard rules that um, they dissolve responsibility of people if they follow these rules. If someone in a car is driving and they follow the traffic light, but they happen to hit someone, they say it's okay. Um, if we don't have traffic lights, everyone has to be responsible for moving slowly through this intersection and interacting with each other. Um, I went totally around your question, but I want to encourage a, yeah, um, a sort of different way of thinking about this. Um, who was the second group in addition to the disabled? Uh, the emergency services. Yeah. yeah, so in terms of that, um, that's a little more straightforward. Yes, emergency services were able to access this intersection as needed. They were consulted in the beginning, um, but yeah, before the intervention, and uh, 
throughout this evaluation, they were also satisfied with, with the uh, yeah with everything. Okay, well, thank you very much, Trey. Um, we run out of time for the questions. So the questions that are still coming in, um, we will collect them and uh, send them to Trey. So if you have any more questions, uh, please write them down now and we can send them to them, send uh, them to him. And if you have any more questions afterwards, please uh, remember that you can always write Trey uh, as he said before. Um, okay, so that's it from me tonight. Yeah, Facundo, is it also easiest? Um, I know it's hard to get in touch with people after the, this uh, Zoom meeting. So perhaps, yeah, if, if they send me personal, if they have a personal question, they can contact me on email or LinkedIn. Um, yeah, or I think that's probably easiest. What do you guys think? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, the email is the easiest way, I think. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, email would be the best way to contact Trey. Uh, also, is I think you know, I hope you guys have noted down his uh, contact details for LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, please do follow up with him if you have any more questions or anything that you would like to discuss with him. Uh, and with this, uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining for today's session. Before we go, I just wanted to introduce the rest of the team that's working hard to bring these sessions to you. Uh, that includes me, Artem, who's from Berlin, uh, Facundo, who's also there to, on today's session. He's from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And uh, we also have uh, two new mem mentors on the team this session, uh, which is Yasmin and Anna. And uh, some of you might be familiar with them uh, on the Spanish language sessions. Uh, I'm also excited to announce our next session, which is going to be on Thursday, 22nd of October at uh, 1400 UTC. Uh, it's going to be a virtual cycle tour of Amsterdam uh, by Meredith Yasser. And uh, with, uh, in your email invites that you might have received before for this session, uh, there's a link to a video of the cycle tour. And I'd really appreciate it if you can take the time out and watch the video before you come on the sessions, because it will give you a better perspective on, on what she's going to talk about and also help you ask questions. The video itself is fairly long, about 40 to 50 minutes now. So we wouldn't have, we don't have the time to, to, to broadcast it during the session itself. Um, please do follow us on Instagram on Urban Cycling Institute or also join our Telegram group, uh, the link to which I'm sharing on the chat right now uh, to keep yourself updated about future sessions uh, that we are planning. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all again for joining and I hopefully will see you guys for the next session. Thanks. Bye-bye.